I don't think you will recognize this place. It's in Syria. I don't know what it looks like at this stage. But this is a place called Ebla. What has been discovered at Ebla? Many interesting things. Let's travel to the museum at a place called Idlib, about 30 k's from here. And there's a tremendous excavation, uh, uh, exhibition of clay tablets. Not only the name Lakish was found here, but also many other biblical related cities and peoples, as I've mentioned before. Now, what else does the Bible tell us about Lakish? Why was this, the destruction of this city, saved for posterity? And I discovered something very interesting. Where did sin begin? You know, if sin begins somewhere, it spreads all over the place. Listen what Micah says. Harness the horses to the chariots, inhabitants of Lakish. You were the first to lead the people of Zion into sin. It's interesting. And here we have excavations telling us how they came to an end. The first place where sin started in Zion. The rebellious acts of Israel are not found in you. This is a very sad statement. The place where sin began in Israel. Ahoroni, a, a great archaeologist, excavated many heathen deities at the site which proves but Micah says that sin began in Lachish. Temples dedicated to sun worship were excavated here, and here you're looking at some of them. Lachish says, you begin with sin, you end up in ruins. What did Sennacherib do after the destruction of Lachish? By the way, you see a, a black mark there. Whenever you visit Middle East and you see that black mark, below is the original, above is the restoration. Second Kings 18.17, Then the king of Assyria sent commanders in chief, his quartermaster and his field commander with a large army from Lachish to the king Hezekiah at Jerusalem. He took the rest of the, he took the, rest of the army to Libna, another city, we haven't excavated enough at Lipna yet, where he received shocking news. There's Lipna, close to Azika and close to Lakish. Uh, this is the room of the letters. There are so much to tell you about Lakish, but we time, time is a factor. The field commander returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against. Lipna had heard that the king left Lakish. So he destroyed the city and now he was, he was fighting at Lipna. At Lipna, he had to decide. He got news from the king of Syria, uh, from, from Egypt, and he wanted to destroy Jerusalem. Shall he be able to fight on two fronts? I think his army was about. 500,000 soldiers. What message did he send to Hezekiah Jerusalem? He wanted this man to uh, capitulate so he didn't have to fight them, just took them in exile. Verse 9, Now Sennacherib heard that King Terhaka of Sudan, we hear about Sudan lately, was coming to fight him. Sennacherib sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, Tell King Hezekiah of Judah, 
Don't let the God whom you trust deceive you by saying that Jerusalem will not be put under the control of the king of Syria. I'm going to destroy you, my friend. You might as well give over. Surrender. Now, some of these stones at the Damascus Gate, they used the old stones to build this, Suleiman the Magnificent, witnessed what happened here. And I wish they could speak to us, telling us about the history of the city. Verse 11, you heard what the kings of Assyria did to all the countries, how they totally destroyed them. Will you be rescued? Famous battlefield of the five stones. Have you heard about the battle of the five stones? Sennacherib stationed his forces nearby the valley of Elah where David and Goliath also had a, a fight. I wonder, when he came here, did he hear about David and David's God? Here we have one of the most dramatic stories of divine intervention in the Bible. It also has an eschatological component. Sennacher prays in front of divine symbols and his gods. It didn't help. He didn't conquer Jerusalem. It records his achievements and expansion of his royal capital, Nineveh. But uh, he had one big failure, the only failure in his life. He wanted to destroy Jerusalem and God's people, and he failed. If you live close to God, the Sennacherib, the devil, will not destroy you. The Syrian stones are going to cry, cry out again, the Bible is true. Now, how many prisms were discovered to confirm the authenticity of the Bible concerning King Sennacherib? And in my research, <clears throat> I came up across something fantastic. Jerusalem Prism was the first one published in 1990. You can visit this in Jerusalem, see it there. This one in the Oriental Institute in Chicago was donated by Breasted. So here you've got a second one recording the story of Sennacherib and Jerusalem outside the Bible. Are two evidences enough to convince us of the biblical account that Sennacherib's, of Sennacherib's failed attempts to destroy Jerusalem? You know, the word forgiveness in the Bible is repeated. And we find the same thing in archaeology. Great stories are repeated. And I discovered a third one in the British Museum. Is God trying to tell us something about his protecting love? This is what I, I glean from archaeology. God's protecting love. The caption reads, This terracotta foundation record lists the campaigns of Sennacherib from his ascension in 705 and includes a description of Hezekiah, king of Judah in 701. So here we find the name of Hezekiah in the annals of Sennacherib. So the Bible, my friend, is true. As one of the first major Assyrian documents found about 1830, it played an important part in the decipherment of cuneiform script. Where was this discovery made? Let's continue reading. I found it at Nineveh. It was discovered among the ruins of ancient Nineveh by Taylor in 1830. Of all Assyrian documents that have come down to us, not one is in better preservation than this one. God wants us to have another look at the story of how he protected Jerusalem because the end time Jerusalem, God's people, will also be protect, protected 
when the world and the devil will try to destroy you, my faithful believer in God. Let's get a message from what happened here. I read it again, and I thought, of all Assyrian documents, not one is better preserved than this one, telling how God protected his people. Why does God remind us three times of his power to save in archaeology? He wants you to believe that he can save you. Will God again preserve his end time followers against the end time enemy? Typology says yes. Hezekiah took the threat of total annihilation to the Lord in prayer. Best thing he could do. 2 Kings 19.19 Now Lord our God rescue us from Assyria's control so that all the kingdoms on earth will know that you alone are the Lord. At the end time we're going to pray the same prayer. After Hezekiah got up from his knees, he began digging a 533-meter-long tunnel. I've been through this tunnel many times. It's quite an experience. Why must our prayers be followed by action? Prayers are not designed for lazy people. There's something we can do as well. One team began digging at the fountain of Gion, where Solomon was crowned king just outside the city wall, the Hinnom Valley and the Kidron Valley in that area. Fit your little light to your head. They give you a little light. Well, you can take it, your own torch uh, and start walking the 533 meters in this tunnel. Especially in summertime, it's so cool down there. We're wading through water where people from the time of Hezekiah did the same. It's exciting. This is more than just scrolling through water. We are at the site of true biblical history. And you get the sign there where they said this inscription was done approximately 2,000 yeah, 2,700 years ago. Right here they made the, the, the discovery. I searched for the original one and found it at uh, Istanbul, the museum. And the curator specially opened that floor. It was closed at that stage when I said, him, said to him, please. So I went up and I took this picture. This six-line inscription was found six meters from the exit to the Siloam pool which is another great story. What does it say about the two opposite teams meeting one another? And you can read the entire thing in the Istanbul Museum, but uh, let me give you a synopsis of it. It says, while the quarry men were still chopping axes, each man toward his fellow, and while there were still three cubits, to be cut through, there was heard the voice of a man calling to his fellow, for there was an overlap in the rock on the right hand and on the left. Interesting. When they were digging the tunnel, they could hear voices on the other side. And when the tunnel was driven through, the quarry men hewed the rock, each man toward his fellow, Axe against axe, cup, 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 cup. And the water flowed from the spring toward the reservoir for 1,200 cubits. And then the height of the rock above the head of the quarry uh, men was 100 cubits. Interesting piece of info. The team from Gion met the team of Siloam in the middle. So they started there, as you can see on the map, Gion, and there's Siloam. So in the middle of this tunnel, they met. This was a miracle. 
to go like this and meet one another at the end. <laughs> this is tremendous. The reason for digging the tunnel? It was to cut off the water supply from the Assyrians during the siege of the city. They thought the siege would last long. So, Assyrians, you, Assyrians, you will not get water from us. And this is the pool of Siloam. The tunnel ends at the pool of Siloam. They're doing tremendous excavations here. And uh, you can go back to the time of Christ and see how it looked like. But uh, the king did something else to protect Jerusalem. There's a friend of mine, Walter Fight's wife, Sonica, walking there. We were there one time together. Isaiah 22 verse 10 says, You will count the houses in Jerusalem. You will tear down those houses in order to fortify the walls. So they took some of the houses and they built an extra wall to protect them from the a coming Assyrian army. Let's see if we can find the wall. Let's walk through the little lanes in the city of Jerusalem. It's so exciting to walk here and think of the history. Israeli archaeologists excavated part of this wall in Jerusalem and called it the Broad Wall. He really built a broad wall to keep out the enemy. We should also pray and build broad walls to keep out the present time enemy. It was built as an addition fortification to cope with the Syrian threat. After Hezekiah dug the tunnel, built the wall, he trusted in God and relaxed, relaxed in the promises God has made. Do everything in your power. What you can do, because God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. Prayer does not take the place of hard work. It does not encourage laziness. Do everything you can. Pray and leave the rest to God. Looking at the broad wall in Jerusalem, I realized that the God who lived in Hezekiah's time is still the same today. He wants to save besieged sinners like you and me. 37, 33. This is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will never come into the city. Shoot an arrow here. Hold a shield in front of it. And put up dirt ramps to attack it. Promise of God. What it what he had accomplished at thousand other fortified cities, he will not repeat at Jerusalem. Verses 34, 35. He will go back the way he came, and he won't come into the city, declares the Lord of armies. Now he represents himself as a soldier card. I will shield the city. Look at the words he's using to rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. So how many troops did he send from heaven to defend the city? It happened because he challenged God's ability to, live, to deliver Jerusalem and its people from his mighty victorious army. You see, this man challenged God. You cannot challenge God. Our best protection lies in a relationship with him. Five minutes Bible reading, two minutes of prayer, see what happens. The times I visited Nineveh, my thoughts went out to Sennacherib's humiliation. 185,000 soldiers were killed. His army got a dent. Isaiah 37, 36. The Lord's angel went out and killed 185 soldiers in the Syrian camp. When the Judeans got up early in the morning, they saw all the corpses. This is going to happen at the end of the thousand years. It will be repeated. At the conquest of Lachish, Sennacherib's ego was elevated 
to the seventh heaven. But at Jerusalem, he was humiliated to the dust. His defeat sent a shock wave throughout the ancient world. Herodotus thought it was a mice plague that killed 185,000 Syrian soldiers. No, Herodotus, it was just one angel. Another shock was awaiting the king. 37. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria left. He went home to Nineveh and stayed there for many ages. It was only the Bible that recorded this information that I'm going to share with you now. And then the archaeological spade surprised us again. What happened here in 1990, just the other day? Archaeologists came here and they said to Saddam Hussein, well, there's great stuff here. Esther Adon's palace is down here and uh, his arsenal. But Islam says you cannot excavate on what they call a holy site. So how did Hussein react to the prohibition? <laughs> he ignored it. And the families were relocated, 400 of them. So excavations could begin. Well, they did not finish the excavations. I was there, unfortunately. But uh, Nineveh is still waiting for maybe you or somebody else to continue the work that they began here. Here they excavated the palace of Esther Hadon, only part of it. June 4, 1990, excavation, a eunuch of Esarhaddon. Here you see it, eunuchs are without beards. The Bible mentions his name and here they found a statue of Esarhaddon, Sennacherib, one of the seven Lamusas. That's the huge bull. I'm standing here with my daughter telling her the history of what happened here. The largest discovery in Iraq in modern times. They excavated seven of these huge bulls. And this excavation cries out, the Bible is true. The two places where diggings were made, Nebi Yunus and Kuyunyak. Verse 38, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, Adremelech, and Sharezer, his sons, assassinated, assassinated him and escaped to the land of Ararat. Ararat is not a mountain, it's a land. His son Esarhaddon succeeded him as king. So here we have the next king. But this is what the Bible says. Do we have archaeological evidence to back this up? Yes. What did Esarhaddon record about the death of his father, which harmonizes with the Bible? Here it is. A firm determination fell upon my brothers. Unholy hostility they planned behind my back. My brothers, trusting in their own counsel, committed unwarranted acts. They gained the kingship. To gain the kingship, they slew Sennacherib, their father. Exactly what Isaiah said happened is confirmed by archaeology. <laughs> I like this. I reached Nineveh, Esaradon says, well pleased. I ascended my father's throne with joy. I am Esaradon, king of the world, king of Assyria, son of Sennacherib. Why does archaeology just keep on confirming the authenticity of of the Bible because there's a war against the Bible. Archaeology says it's a true book. Please read this book. At the site where Sennacherib was assassinated, I reminded my child Loretta that the Bible is the only source that reveals the future and assures us of the love of God. 
This book tells you about a God who loves you, my friend. Read his love letter. Irregular, rectangular-sided monument recording Esaradon's restoration of Babylon. Extra-biblical information. Right at the top, he worships his gods. Look at this. Why didn't he worship the god of Isaiah or Hezekiah? Puppies or people being held by leeches? No, only puppies. But here, he's got people on a leech. Lesson, don't treat people like dogs. They are creations of God, creatures. He boasts of his victories over Pharaoh Taraka and his crown prince, Ush Ush Anahura, kneels before Esaradon. So here we've got info of this great man. May God help us not to lead people by their noses like he's doing in this picture while we pretend to serve the Lord. He's worshipping his gods and he's leading his enemies on a leech. Ah, oh, I learned so many lessons in this research. A figure which is probably Tarakas, one time ally, King Baal of Tyre. There you see it with a leech on his nose. Esaron walks in front while his mother, Queen Nakia, follows. Hey man, this is a great man. Uh, is this position correct? Should mom walk in front and I at the back? And ladies first and men second? What is in her hand? Why carry a mirror in a religious procession? I'm asking many questions. I don't know the answer. Who else in the Bible refers to a mirror? The book of James. He says we must look in the Ten Commandments. That's a mirror that will show you how dirty you are. Please make use of that mirror and go to Christ for cleansing. A line with the names of Esaradon and his father? Any mention of the kings of Judah? I discovered something in my research which excited me. It says, The majesty of my sovereignty overwhelmed Hezekiah. So they also referred to Hezekiah. So we've got his name outside the Bible. This is the Esaron Prism inscription. I was excited when I saw Hezekiah's name here. The Bible is true. There was a Hezekiah. And now we look at the Esaron Prism inscription. He says, I gathered together kings of Syria and the kings from across the sea. Baal, the king of Tyre, and then for the first time, the name Manasseh, the king of Judah, was discovered outside the Bible. So there was a wicked king called Manasseh. By the way, he converted the end of his life of disobedience. It's never too old to convert and accept God. On this ascension document, he names Ashurbanipal as his successor. So before he died, he said, my son Ashurbanipal will be the next king. I went to Lebanon in search of Esarhaddon's inscription. In my search for Nebuchadnezzar inscription, I came across this relief. It's called here Nar el Kalp, the specific site. And there's the Esarhaddon inscription. It mentions Esarhaddon's capture of Memphis in Egypt, the capital of Lower Egypt. Thebes is the other capital. I entered Memphis, his royal residence, amidst general jubilation and rejoicing. Ancient Near Eastern text 293. And this is Nebuchadnezzar's inscription. I was so excited when I got here. What the Bible says of his invasion of Israel, Judah, the Levant, are confirmed 
in this inscription. Does the Bible mention the destruction of Memphis? Yes. Jeremiah 46, 19. Pack your bags, inhabitants of Egypt, because you will be taken away as captives. Memphis will become a dreary wasteland, a pile of rubble where no one lives. This is what Esaradon says. The Bible says, yes, that's right. So the two sources confirm one another. This is Memphis. Ezekiel says, 30 verse 13, this is what the Almighty Lord says. I will destroy the statues and put an end to the idols in Memphis. A prince will never rise again in Egypt. I will spread fear throughout Egypt. I was there. There's nothing left of Memphis. All that is left of the once mighty city is a display of a few excavations, very few. What an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And this invasion was done by the Assyrian kings and they mentioned exactly what the Bible mentions about this invasion. Esaradon mentions Manasseh. I was so happy when I discovered this. Did he learn of the forgiving God of Israel and Adat Nirari III? I'm just wondering. Shame. He died here at Haran on his way to Egypt. Did someone tell him of the story of Abram and his father Tira, who died here? You know, God wanted these heathen kings to learn more about him as the good God who ascended the throne after his death? Well, he said in his will, it should be uh, Ashurbanipal. And this happened. He left a large legacy of mural reliefs. This prism records that he ruled from 669 to 627 BC. He also mentioned his successful campaign against Memphis and Thebes, just as the biblical prophets tell us. Name 3 8. Are you better than No Amon? He speaks of Thebes here. He's addressing Nineveh, which sits by the streams of the Nile with water surrounding her. The sea was a defense, the water was a wall. Ninefi, do you think you are better than uh, Thebes? What was his booty like when he destroyed Thebes? Tons of gold. The prophet describes Ninefi's fall of 612 BC as follows. Name 2, 10. Ninefi is destroyed, deserted, demolished, Hearts are melting, knees are knocking, every stomach becomes upset, every face turns pale. When the city was destroyed in 601, this is what they experienced. They destroyed the world, and now they were going to be destroyed. When I visited Mosul, I saw Saddam Hussein in this picture, and uh, hunting of lions. Now the skeptic says, lions in Iraq, where do you come from this? Until they discovered, well, there were lions. I searched for the presence of lions in Iraq because the Bible mentions them and I found them. Psalm 2 verse 11 says, where is the lion's den, that feeding place for young lions? Where are the lion, the lionesses, and the lion cub who moved about with no one to terrify them. So Nahum says there were lions, but now it's all gone. What happened? Layard and Rassam excavated them and confirmed the truth of the Bible. Here you see lions. You know, whatever the Bible says, even if he says there are lions, there were lions in Iraq, please believe it. And when he says, I can forgive you, please believe him. And if he says you can have victory over sin, please believe him. Just look at this. 
This discovery ended the accusations of the critics about the presence of lions in Iraq. Archaeology once more confirmed the authenticity of the Bible. If you haven't got one, please buy one. Listen to what the prophet saw in vision. Name 3, 2 and 3. The sound of the whip. Destruction of Nineveh. The sound of rattling wheels from Nebuchadnezzar and Abu Pulasa and uh, Seacheres from uh, Ekbatana. Horses gallop, chariots bounce along. Horses charge, swords flash, spears glitter. Many are killed, dead bodies pile up. There is no end to the corpses. People trip over the corpses. So the prophet saw exactly what was going to happen in 601 to Nineveh. You know, you can carry on for a while, but eventually sin will catch up with you. What you sow, you will reap. This is what happened to Nineveh. 2007 years ago, the prophet saw what we are looking at. Armies of Nebuchadnezzar approaching Nineveh. Does archaeology help you in appreciating the Bible just a little more? I hope so. This is what I was trying to tell you in these eight lectures. Any good news for victims of cruelty? Within the near future, they will be free and safe forever. Are you longing for a country without failed relationships? Maybe your marriage went on the rocks. Maybe a good friend of yours, something happened. But are you looking for a country where relationships will never fail? A country where you will not use a handkerchief to wipe a tear. The chemists are doing good business selling tablets, painkillers. Can you imagine a place without pain? Forever. You've been to funerals and I've been to a few. There will not be funerals in the hereafter. Eternal life awaits us. Revelation 21 verse 4. And maybe you can help me here. And God shall wipe away all, it starts with a T, tears, from their e, eyes. And there shall be no more the death. Death of relationships as well. Neither sorrow nor, see, crying. Neither shall there be any more p, pain, physical or mental pain. For the former things are passed away. <laughs> heaven at last. Father in heaven, we've learned about you as a wonderful God, one who wants to give us eternal life. And if the enemy wants to lure us away, please help us to stay on the way of obedience. And may we meet soon in a better land. In Jesus' name, Amen.